Hey everybody, thanks for continuing with us in session 10 of this online Bible study course on the subject of understanding grace. And uh, we've, we've gotten into a lot of different aspects of grace and uh, what grace looks like in the life of Jesus as he walked in the earth in his humanity. Uh, though he didn't cease to become God, he stripped himself of that power and glory walked in the earth as a man, accessing the grace of God to do everything that he did so that he could be our blueprint and our example for life and ministry. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that uh, that I can now see Jesus in that light. It gives me hope to tap into the grace that I need to walk free from sin and, and uh, above all of the, the things of the enemy and the things of the world. And so thank God uh, for the revelation that the Holy Ghost has given us on the humanity of Jesus. Now, we're not saying that Jesus ceased to become God and that he was only human. No, we're saying that he always existed as God. From the beginning, he existed as God. And, uh, and he came to this earth as a man to accomplish what only a man could accomplish because God, in the beginning, delegated the earth to a man. A man got the earth in the mess it was in. A man had to get it out because he's the one that had authority. So God came as a man. He stripped himself of his power and glory, laid it aside, not forever, but while he was here on the earth and accomplished what he accomplished as a man. And as we see Jesus as a man walking in the earth, accessing the grace of God, overcoming sin, having authority over the devil, you know, obeying the will of the Father, only because the grace and the anointing of God was upon him, empowering him to do that, then it allows us to see the hope that we have to walk in that same grace and in that same power. And so thank God for that revelation and thank God for the message of grace that it seems that the Holy Spirit is emphasizing in these last days. And the reason is because you're going to need a lot of grace to do what God's called you to do. You're going to need a lot of supernatural ability, and you're going to need a lot of divine favor to do what God's called you to do. God hasn't called you to do something in the natural. He hasn't called you just to be a natural person in the earth, live whatever lifespan that you are, are going to live on the earth, and then die and go to heaven and receive some kind of inheritance or reward once you get there. But God left us an inheritance to tap into and enjoy right now and favor for right now and, and grace and power for right now. So whatever you're facing right now, if you're facing some kind of addiction or if you're facing some kind of a wall that you can't seem to get past or man, if you're just, if you're just burn out, if you're just if you're at a place in your Christian walk where you're just like, man, I, I just don't even know if I want to do this anymore. I'm, I'm tired. I'm burnt out. I can promise you this. The way that you got there, the way that you got to that place of burnout is by trying to do life without the grace of God. And when we try to live life on our own terms and our own effort, then we burn out. We, we don't do things God's way. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden and, and overworked and exhausted and burnt out. He said, come unto me and I will give you rest. And grace is a rest. It's where God's power's working in your behalf and on your behalf without you trying to, to maintain that and try to get it to work. And it's just working. It's flowing from your heart. There's a divine flow of, of joy and a divine flow of peace and a divine flow of, of power, and you're not stressed out, that's the grace life. That's the life of freedom that Jesus came to bring us. And so Jesus said, come unto me, and I will give that to you. And he said, take my yoke upon you. For He said, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So if you're, if you're carrying something that's not easy, and that's not light, if it's heavy, if it's wearing you out, it's not the grace of God. It's not God's plan. It's not God's power. You may be uh, trying to pursue God's plan, but you're doing it in a way that's killing you, in a way that's, that's discouraging you. 
And so there's joy in grace and there's peace in grace. And so this is what we're doing in this course. We're accessing and laying hold of the supernatural ability and the divine favor of God given to us entirely apart from merit or what we can do, causing us to do what we could never do in our own strength. Doesn't that sound good? I mean, doesn't it sound good to wake up in the morning and have strength to do what you're called to do and rest and easy? I don't know about you, but it, it, it sounds good to me uh, when I think of working hard and laboring hard, and then you sit down into your favorite place of rest. There's nothing like that. And that's where God wants us to live. So we're studying grace and we're learning how to access God's grace and his power uh, and, and learning how to walk into it there and, and get into that rhythm of grace every day. Every day, we, we, everything we do in God and everything we do in life, we do it with a rhythm of his power working in our life. And that's how Jesus walked. That's how we can walk. So in this part of this course, we're walking around what we call the mountain of grace. And I say this, I'll say this again because repetition is the motor of learning and you get a hold of things by hearing it over and over. But every truth in the scripture, every major truth uh, in the scripture is like a mountain. We just got back from the mountains and man, out in Colorado, that's where the, the beautiful mountains are. And, and, and we saw Pikes Peak. And uh, we're, we're, we stood in one area and we saw Pikes Peak. And then the next day we drove around to a city on the other side of the mountain. And you can see the mountain from a totally different perspective. Same mountain, different view. Does it change the mountain when your view changes? It just adds to the totality of what the mountain is. So when we try to approach any truth, whether it's the love of God or faith in God or the grace of God, all of these uh, foundational major truths of the word of God, when we look at them from just a couple of scriptures, we're looking at them from a view and we have a, a specific view. And then when we go to another scripture, we find another view. And when we go to another scripture, we find another view. And it's adding to the total understanding of how we see this subject. And, and this is the, the sad thing is a lot of people, they don't study the word of God like this. They, they, they get into a, a few scriptures. They isolate those scriptures. They form a doctrine from a few isolated texts. So a lot of people have done with the grace of God and they've, they've skewed it. They've twisted it. And uh, we're going to see uh, uh, some of that in, in today's session. But when we get into every New Testament scripture, and that's what we're doing with grace, we get into every New Testament scripture and we look at grace from that perspective and ask ourselves from the book of Acts, from the book of Romans, from the book of Galatians, from the book of Ephesians, you know, what is grace from this perspective, from Paul's perspective, from Peter's perspective? How do they explain grace and how, what is their revelation that they're giving us here of grace? When we walk around the whole mountain of grace, we see it in its entirety and we understand not just, we don't just have a new doctrine. We have the ability to access the grace of God by the faith that we have now in the promises of God. You know, God uh, spoke, the Holy Spirit spoke through Peter in, in 2 Peter chapter 1. And he said, uh, he wants us to understand that, that all things have been given to us that pertain to life and godliness, and we partake of those things through the knowledge of him. And so that's what we're getting here. We're getting the knowledge of him, and through the knowledge of him, the goal is not just to know it, but the goal is to partake of it, to taste of it, to see the reality of it working in our lives. And that's what's happening in me, and that's what's happening in you. So we left off in uh, session nine, in Acts chapter 14 and verse 3. And so we're going to move on from there uh, into Acts chapter 14 and verse 26. And that's the next scripture that talks about the grace of God. And so let's look at it together. 
Uh, if you need the notes for all of this, you can go to our website at danemassey.com. You can download the notes and follow us, or you can make your own notes. But get your Bible and follow us along with your Bible. Even though the scriptures will be on the screen, I'm telling you, it means so much more to you when you can turn to it and see it and follow it in your, in your Bible. And so do that. And turn with us to, uh, to Acts 14 and verse 26. And it says this, it says, From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. For there they sailed to Antioch, where they, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they completed. Now, what is, what is grace? How do we see grace? from this scripture. Well, notice the word commended. The word commended means this. It means to give over into one's power. So when, when, when uh, just say somebody uh, went and picked up a prisoner and they came and they turned him over to uh, uh, the authorities in another city, well, they commended that prisoner into their hands. Uh, it means to give over into one's power. So here it says that they, the, the work which they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had, had completed. So the work that we complete will only be because we, we give ourselves over to the power of God's grace. So you've you got a choice here. You can, you can try to do things in your own strength, or you can realize God has power for me to accomplish this. God has power for me to do this. Whatever, I, whatever I'm called to do in this moment, whether it's being a, a parent and you need wisdom for parenting or whether you're a minister and you, you're faced with decisions for your church and your ministry or, or whether it's just, it's just life, whatever you come up against in, in life. You can either do it in your own strength. You can try to figure it out in your own reason with your own intellect, your own understanding, and you can writhe your hands together about it and wonder about what you're supposed to do and be concerned and fret and stress out over it. Or you can realize, wait a minute, God has grace for me to do this. Anything I face in life, anything I face in ministry, God has supernatural ability and divine favor for me to do it in. So what I need to do right here is stop and commend myself to the grace of God. Hand myself over to the grace of God. Turn myself over, my, my thoughts, my, I yield myself to God's supernatural ability and his divine favor working on my behalf apart from merit, causing me to do what I can't do in my strength. So I, we have to get uh, good. Uh, we have to acquire the habit of commending ourselves to the grace of God for the work that he's called us to do. Commend ourselves to it. Every time we get up in the morning, we commend ourselves. Lord, I commend myself to your grace. I turn myself over to the grace of God. I, 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 I commend my, my heart. I commend my actions today to the grace of God. You know, whenever I, I'm a minister and when I preach in churches and when I uh, preach, you know, in, in different places that we go, uh, before I preach, that's what I do. I say, Father, I realize in my own ability, I cannot do what it what it takes to minister and and bring effect and change and 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 bring healing and revelation to the people that I'm ministering to. I don't have that ability. I don't have the ability to do that. Uh, I realize that my 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 ability will always come to an end. So I choose not to trust in that. So I commend myself now, Lord to your power, your ability to speak through me, your ability to give me revelation, your ability to open my eyes, to give me utterance, to speak and to preach and to minister. I commend myself to the grace of God. So this is how we can see grace from Acts 14, 26. Grace is, is a power that you can tap into by releasing your faith, by commending yourself to the grace of God. Thank God that we can do that. The next scripture is Acts 15 and verse 11. Acts 15 and verse 11. <clears throat> it says here, but we believe 
that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, remember he walked in that grace, talking about the grace that he had, the grace that he walked in, the grace that belonged to him, that now belongs to us because we're now in Christ. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Now, this is talking about how the Gentiles are, have, have a right to come into the kingdom just like the Jews. Jesus said he was come to minister to the Jews, but he brought salvation to the Gentiles and the Jews. God only sees three groups of people in the earth. Uh, he sees Jews. He sees Gentiles. That's people with a covenant. He sees Gentiles, people with no covenant. Then he sees the church. That's people from those two groups that get born again. And they're both those groups, Jews and Gentiles, must be born again to enter into this other group that God sees, and it's the group called the church. And they here the Gentiles are being introduced to salvation and brought into the kingdom of God. And so as they're given the report of this, they say that we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So what does that mean and what does that tell us about grace? We are saved. What does it mean to be saved? It means to be, uh, you know, you may have heard this, that the Greek word for saved means uh, so, sozo. It's the Greek word sozo. It means to be preserved and healed and delivered and set free all one in one package. It's a, it, it's being saved. Doesn't mean just getting a ticket to heaven. Doesn't mean just getting eternal life. Uh, you had eternal life. You, you had, you had life eternally before you got saved. In other words, you were going to live, you were going to live forever, uh, before you received Jesus. You just didn't, you were either going to live forever in hell or you're going to live forever in the presence of God. But when you get born again, you get the eternal life of God living in you and you're saved, you get the whole package deal of healing and salvation and deliverance and freedom. It all now belongs to you. It's all now a part of your inheritance. And here, he says that we are saved in the same manner of they. It's through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through grace, we're saved. You're saved, not because you're so good, not because you've been going to church for so long, not because you pray, a lot or even pray at all, you're saved because of the grace of Jesus, because God loves you so much that he sent Jesus as a man into the earth to take your place and to pay your price for sin and bring you into an inheritance and, and, and raise you up to be seated with Jesus. And now you're in that position. You're there. Nothing more is required. Nothing more is needed to be in Christ. You've got it. You've arrived. You're in Jesus. And it's all because of the grace of God. Can't boast about it. Can't say, well, look what I've done since I've become a Christian. No, it's all because of the grace of God. So here we see grace from Acts 15, 11. We're saved because of his supernatural power and his favor working in us at the new birth. All right, the next scripture we're going to move on to is Acts chapter 15 and verse 40. It says, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And if you're taking notes, you can write in your notes there. Same thing as Acts 14, 26. There's that word commended again. And Paul's, <clears throat> and the book of Acts is talking about it, how Paul's Paul and Silas went out commended by the brethren to the grace of God. We send people out. We, we send them out trusting that God's grace is going to work in them. Boy, you have to do that with your children, don't you? Uh, my, my daughter is, is uh, 19 years old, about to turn 20 years old at the time of this uh, taping of this session. And so she graduated from high school just a couple of years ago. And at 18 years old, she moved 1500 miles away. She believed God was leading her to a Bible school. And so, you know, that was a, that was a huge, huge step of faith for us. You know, we, uh, we'd never had children before. She's our only child. And so for 18 years, we've enjoyed having her and loved her. And man, life was good with her there with us. And then all of a sudden, one day you wake up and they're gone and uh, not forever, but they're gone obeying the will of God. 
And so here's something that uh, a step that I had to take in, in, uh, in sending out my daughter, I had to commend her to the grace of God. I had to say, Father, I don't have the power, the ability to control what's going on in her life anymore. I don't have the ability and the power to protect her anymore and, and keep her in my care. So Lord, I commend her to you. I trust you every day for the grace of God to work in her. I trust you. And man, when fear fear tries to get a hold of me, and I and it does, you know, just like it will you, you know, when your children, you know, and it starts when they get old enough to go to school and they, they leave and you take them to school for the first time. And man, your heart's just torn because they're, they're now in a place that you don't have control over. Or maybe your children are, are in private school or even public school or where, wherever they are. We can commend our children to the grace of God. That's good news. We can commend our parents to the grace of God. You know, when your parents get older, you want to, you want to, man, it'd just be great to be there every day and take care of them. And that's great if you can. But if you can't, maybe because you live in a different place or maybe because God's called you to a different place, you know, the, the, the best place for you to be for your parents is in the will of God. And so sometimes that requires you not being with them. And so we can commend them to the grace of God. Uh, you know, we can say, Father, I, I trust that you work in them by your grace, by your power. I don't have to be concerned about my children. I don't have to be concerned about my parents. I don't have to stress over that, wonder if they're going to be okay. I can trust you, Lord, and I can I can release my faith in you and commend them over into your grace, give them over into the power of your grace. Thank God that we can do that. And so here's the same thing as Acts 14, 26. And I love that word, commend. Uh, let that become a word that you start using uh, in your life when you're praying for people and praying for uh, your, your, if you're a pastor, praying for your church and the members of your church, or for uh, if you're a member of a church and praying for your pastor, Lord, I commend them to the grace of God. I trust that your grace is going to work in them to make the decisions that they need to make. I'm not going to complain, Lord. I'm not going to gossip and murmur and get into unbelief and start stressing about that. I commend them to your grace, and I'm going to walk in peace and walk in faith. Man, it's so good that we can do that. And so Acts 15, 40 is the same as Acts 14, 26. So the next scripture, we're going to move, we're moving around the mountain of grace in Acts chapter 18 and verse 27, it says this, it says, and when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the, the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. They believed through grace. You know, this is good news because, you know, sometimes we think that, you know, yeah, God will do what he does and, and we can we know that he'll do his part, but our part is believing. And we think that that believing is something that's entirely up to us. And, and, and it is, but yet we have help. The grace of God even helps us to believe. Thank God for that. You know, and so he says here that he helped these people who had believed through grace. We become believers through grace, not because we've gotten good at the scriptures or gotten good at whatever we do for God, but we cannot forget that there are only two kinds of people that call themselves Christians in the earth. Now, notice I said there are two kinds of people that call themselves Christians. It doesn't mean that they are. A lot of you can you can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself. That doesn't make you what you call yourself. And there are only two kinds of people that call themselves Christians. Number one, it's people that believe that their efforts save them. You know, there are religions and there are denominations that believe that their efforts save them. They believe that they're saved through doing all these different things and, and, and this 
we got to do all this and we got to obey all these rules and all these regulations and all these ordinances and make sure we're, we're taking communion during this time and making sure that we, you know, and I'm not trying to make fun of any religion. I'm just saying that there's a lot of denominations and religions out there that the foundations of what they believe is nothing but works. It's not faith and it's not grace. It's works. And so, you know, we, we can even turn our faith into works if we're not careful. We can think that our faith is something that we give God that causes God to give something back to us. We, we can, we can see, we can see faith as like a means of exchange. You know, money is a means of exchange in, our, in, in the world today. And then in, in uh, America where we live, the U.S. dollar is our means of exchange. And so we can take the U.S. dollar and, and exchange it for goods. And if you're not careful, you'll begin to think that that's the way your faith is and that that's what God wants. God wants me to respond to him in faith. And once I respond to him in faith, then it causes him to give me what I need in my life. Well, that's not what faith is. Faith is is simply your response to what he has already done, not a response that he's looking for so that he will do what he can do. But faith is a response to something that he's already done. See, we're God's not saving people today because he already laid his life down and paid the price for the world to be saved 2,000 years ago. And so, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 and 18 talk about how God was in Christ in the work that he did in his death, burial, and resurrection. God was in that reconciling the world to himself. And so the world, in a sense, has been reconciled to God. Once they hear the good news and release faith, in other words, once they respond in faith to what God's already done, then the new birth takes place. The power of the Holy Spirit explodes on the inside of an unbeliever with light and with life, and they're born again when they release faith in the finished work of Jesus, not when they give God something so that he'll give them back. You know, God's not in heaven going, you know, if you'll just give me faith, then I'll save you. No, he's already saved us just like he's already healed us. He's already delivered us in the finished work of Jesus. And so when we respond to that in faith, in other words, we look at that finished work and say, okay, based on what he did, I receive it. I, I, I take hold of it. I, I'll have that. I take your forgiveness. I take your healing. I take deliverance from that problem. I receive that because of what you did. I have it now. That's faith. And then God, uh, the power of God begins to work in a person who responds to the finished work of Jesus in faith. So we can't turn faith into dead works by thinking that it's something that God's requiring of us, you know, and, or, or here's another way to put it. If you don't give God faith, he will withhold what you need. See, that, that's, a, that's a way to look at God that's wrong. It's not right when you look at God like that. God is not withholding something from us until we have enough faith. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that believe that. Well, if I could just get enough faith. Or if I, man, if I could just have the faith of brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so or faith like my mom or faith like my aunt, or if I just had faith like that, see that, that's, that mentality is a mentality that thinks that God is not going to move on your behalf until you have enough faith. And that's a wrong thinking about faith. That's, that's causing faith to become a dead work. It doesn't work when you're, when you believe like that. So you don't need more faith to get something more from God. You've, you've got all the faith that you need. It just needs to be released in what Jesus has already done. You know, faith is like uh, the muscles that, we, that we're given in life, that we're born with. You know, as you grow, you don't need more muscles. You have a certain amount of muscles that are given to you as a human being when you're born into this earth. You've got all the muscles that you need to be 
Mr. Universe or Mrs. Whatever you want to be. You got everything that you need. You just, you just got to start using those. You just got to start working those in God's plan. And so faith, you don't need more faith. Jesus said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you'd respond, you'd react. If you had faith, just like a mustard seed, you would say, see, faith like a seed has to be released and not released in something that God will do, but released in something that he has done. So according to the scripture, there are only two kinds of people that call themselves Christians. Number one, people that think that they're saved by their works or saved by their effort, and they get things based on their effort or or how much faith they have. Then there's another group that believes that they're saved by grace, by the grace of God. Grace works in me when I respond to the finished work of Jesus. Grace works in me. Things work. Things begin to happen when I simply look at the finished work of Jesus and say, yes, that was enough. And I received today based on that event that happened over 2000 years ago. I'm not going to add to it. I don't need to add to it. It was enough to save me, heal me, deliver me. And I say, according to what he did, I have what he said I can have. I can do what he said I can do. Man, the grace of God is so liberating. It it sets us free from a life of trying to be and delivers us and translates us into a life of just being, a life of just resting and enjoying what Jesus came to bring us. And thanks for listening today. And go back over these notes and and, uh, your notes and uh, write down some things that really spoke to you maybe about five things. We like to tell you to do that and it helps you to remember them and helps you to discuss them if you're going through this with a group and then look, find something that really spoke to you and say, man, I'm going to, I'm going to pinpoint this one thing and I'm going to, I'm going to see this uh, in reality in my life this week. I'm going to be a doer of this in Jesus name. God bless you. We'll see you in the next session.